Okay, welcome. Today's technical session is on finding and organizing references. This was the day I picked to do this, and there's a reason for it, because today is a call to action. It is March 4th. So after today, you will march forth and know how to find and organize references. And if you don't, it's your fault, because here I am. All right, so we're going to move on. About this talk, this talk is a technical session. It's not going to be some in-depth discussion of how to use a particular reference manager. That would take forever. There's a lot of them. I will cover a little bit of Mendeley. Like, just like you wouldn't have a lecture on how to build a house, right? Where you're like, the whole first part of the lecture was talking about holding onto a hammer, right? It's not going to help you. Those are the tools. Mendeley is a tool. We're going to be talking bigger picture, why you do references in the first place, how you select them. So the real question is not, how do I make the time I spend adding references minimal, which I see all the time. And when we get to the final section of this, I'm going to be talking about the impact of the references you pick on how your paper is reviewed, in case you care. So it shouldn't be about, oh, let's just get this out of the way. It should be, how do I make the time I spend adding references impactful? And so I would argue on the very extreme side that I try to create a new set of references every time I write a paper. That doesn't mean that I go in there with no way of, of going about it. I'll show you how I do that. I actually do it with a little tiny spreadsheet. That's what we're going on. So the outline of this talk, why include a reference? That you didn't think of that. You just go pick a reference because it's like something you've read, right? And we'll talk about a few things to get that get references from, including Google Scholar, which is a superset of Google patents, ResearchGate, Primo, et cetera. You've got Primo as a CSU student. It incorporates a lot of stuff, right? And you can sign into things like the IEEE and the ACM uh, digital libraries by connecting through Primo or connecting through your CSU ID. How do I preserve my references? So that's where a lot of people go, oh, I need Mendeley or something like that. And I'll talk about a few of those. But you preserve your references by preserving the searches you use to get them, because that way they will refresh every time you do a new paper. One of the worst things I see, and I do this all the time for various journals, AC, ICAE is a good example of a journal that I review for that I see authors showing up every couple of years. And I look back through the references and they're all the same as two years ago. So guess what I do to the paper? I send it back. It's like you haven't done anything to refresh this, so you just lazily grab the references from last time. Well, they were in perfect format because they were in Mendeley, but that didn't matter. And then we'll talk about confidential and proprietary documents and IP. And we'll have it exactly one slide on IP. So it's not an IP talk, don't worry. Why include a reference? <clears throat> so putting together your reference list is a time to do some other things. You wanna rerun the searches you've run in the past. You don't wanna just start afresh. And then you determine which references to use based on the category inside of your paper. Most papers have the following five or some facsimile to them. An introduction, a methods and materials, results, discussion, and conclusions. And if you do the introduction right, that's the way you're going to do it at a macro size for your own thesis or dissertation. You're going to go through and get all of those references and make that happen. So we'll give an example of each of those in the following. So there's a bold statement here. The only reason to include a reference is to improve the quality of your paper. That's my statement. And Plankton's asking me to elaborate. I will elaborate in five different ways, starting with the introduction. So with the introduction of the paper, you want to include the right references. You have a particularly broad survey and review articles to start off with, and you incorporate many additional references by them. But then you go through those to see if any of those are also valuable. So with the introduction, you're kind of starting at a big picture. So this is a good example. This is a review that I did on porous materials for bone engineering way back in the 90s. And it's cited several hundred times because a lot of people just go back and, and take the few major points that we brought to that in terms of where you would make a trade-off between using polymers, using ceramics, using metals, using plastics, et cetera. And they don't have to justify that. They go in this review, such and such was provided. Oh, and this review, by the way, incorporates everything that came before that because there was a beautiful set of 200 references at the end of this review. Because a review paper, of course, needs to be more comprehensive than a regular paper. And if it's not, and you've left somebody out, you're more, you should be chastised more for that in a review paper. So that's a good place to include those review papers. And the reason you also include those is because you should go through the reference list at the end of those and see which of those are the ones that are most salient. So keep that in the background because we'll talk about saliency for articles here shortly. The second elaboration, materials and methods. So we hate this, right? You're doing something because somebody told you to do this, right? 
So old, old Prof uh, Smith said, you got to add this in there and you got to do this stuff. And Prof Smith's been doing it for 40 years in their lab. And so you have to do it. All right. So you want to use a reference to avoid lengthy justification of previously peer reviewed methods, processes, or materials. So if somebody's already been doing this, it's been peer reviewed. They've got feedback on it. And it's something extremely boring. I picked the most boring type of this that I've published in the past. Listen to that. This title will put you to sleep if it isn't already after lunch nappy time. Effect of rehydration state on the flexural properties of whole mouse long bones. I can't make that up. That's a real article. It's been cited 86 times, not because it's brilliant, but because there's 86 people who wanted to test mouse bones mechanically and didn't want to justify the hydration state of those. So they cited this paper and said they use that method. So if you're using a method that you have no idea why it's being used, find a kernel, K-E-R-N-E-L, paper on that that you can use as a reference so that somebody else can go and look it up. Otherwise, you're going to have to provide enough in your own paper for them to repeat the experiment. And this is another place where papers go awry. If you don't have enough in your materials and methods for somebody to be able to recreate your experiment, you're not serving science. So make sure you have those types of references as well. All right, the third one, results. So you want to use previous results to avoid those you know, kind of nagging questions about why you didn't compare your algorithm to a hundred other algorithms preferred by the reviewer. And a lot of reviewers are well-meaning. They're just trying to get you to think about the bigger picture, but some of them are narcissistic sociopaths. And I've had this happen for one of my graduate students here. We're sitting in a PhD prelim and one of the, one of the people on the committee, I won't say who, said, you should be thinking about this type of work and the students didn't get it. They're like, I don't understand the context. It ended up that particular professor had a paper in that area that had been cited a thousand times. And they wanted the student to acknowledge that. And at the end, they said, you didn't know I published that paper. And that, was, that had a thousand citations. You should be citing that in your thesis. So that does happen. And again, never underestimate the impact of narcissism or convenience by your committee or by anybody who's reviewing it, right? That's what the whole internet is. That's what we got social engineering for. It's all about narcissism. And then GPS is about convenience and people give away all of their information for that. So never underestimate the power of narcissism. Make sure you're offsetting that narcissistic sociopath who's going to give your paper a hard time for no good reason. All right. So here's a good example. This is the ICAE journal that I've talked about. I've been a, I don't know, whatever, uh, associate editor on there for quite a long time. They talk about a lot of manuscripts. Manuscripts still present small or overly simplified examples or academic exercises. Such papers were common and might have been appropriate in the 60s, 70s, or 80s. Really kind of needling at home, right? And so really, we are expected as reviewers for that journal to be looking to see if the quality of the data that's coming in is there. Those results are going to be very important. If it's just an academic exercise, then they don't really want that in the, in the journal, right? So they might have said it might have been appropriate. They don't actually say an academic exercise until the very end. Ouch. Drives the point home. All right, our fourth thing to elaborate on is discussion. So here's a chance to show you're not operating in a vacuum, right? So you want to include any reference that you found particularly insightful. So it turns out I looked through my past publications and I tried to think of one that had been cited a lot of times. I was thinking, wow, what about protein concentration from the Lowry method? I looked it up, holy cow, 227,000 times it's been cited. That's a pretty good one for justifying. So even if you aren't using that and you're showing protein concentration, you might want to explain why you didn't do a method that 227,000 previous papers saw fit to do. So you should be aware of those giants in your field, right? So you can't get away without that. All right, let's take a look at the last reason. This would be the conclusions, right? And so again, discussion, conclusion, these things sometimes merge together. It doesn't matter. These are different elements of what you'll have and you should encapsulate this type of concept in your references. So what might you have done if you thought of it first? If you had, if you could go back in time 10 years and say, what are the things that I would do now that I didn't do then? So in image classification, it's definitely going to be convolutional neural networks. They're marvelous, right? 2D convolution allows you to have all kinds of mixed neighborhoods of pixels around the one you're looking at and incorporate those. And it generates in the case of, well, in case of AlexNet, it generates uh, over 600 million different features. Good luck trying to compute those features yourself, right? Now they're not all good features, but if they're scattered enough and you do principal component analysis effectively through the neural net, it gives it out there. Wow, 
93,000 citations, 93,000 from 2012. So you're talking about something that's being cited almost 10,000 times a year. So you better make sure you're incorporating or addressing that because 93,000 people thought this was important in the area you're working in. So don't, you cannot be unaware of those. If you are, you're going to get hammered in the review and by your committee, and in this case, rightly, no narcissistic sociopath involved. All right, so those give you a good idea of why you look for these things and how you look for different types of references in each section. The next thing we're gonna go into is just a quick overview and a little examples of each of these. And so one of the ones you absolutely need to know about is Google Scholar. Google Scholar, for example, is a subset of Google Patents. There's no reason you shouldn't be using those. You find the patents in there. It's just a good idea. Let's jump out to that if we can. See if this will pop up and show on my screen. Wow, wonderful. I like how things work. Room 300 is, it's not changed. All right, we're good. Let's go. So the topic today is going to be red herring. Let's take a look at red herring on Google Scholar. Wow, what do you know? Projecting healthcare expenditure for Swiss, Switzerland, further evidence against the red herring hypothesis. So I go out here, I've got all these. Notice here, citations. Pretty good idea here for me to be able to calculate the saliency as we'll see here shortly. So I've got all of those. And again, you can, you can change this to be since 2022. There's new stuff out there. You can change it to be since 2021. You can have a custom range. You can sort by date, by review articles. You can drop patents or, cita or include citations, drop those as well. So Google Scholar is, is marvelous. And again, you could take an abstract. So you've got this one and you go, what matters in these? You see, let's try this one. Let's say Basile Calmet and see if that gets me more. So you take something out of the title of one that you thought was important. And if I'm type spelling that right, wow, then we've got all of those that are related to that topic. You never have to switch anything. It's natural, it's in your browser, it's built in. Google Scholar is extremely handy for you to be able to pull that down. Now, one of the things you're gonna definitely wanna do with this is if you find an article out there and you can't access it online, and I have no guarantee that I won't be able to access one of these, I'm not even gonna try. Well, this is Ingenta, so you probably have to pay for it. We just grab this and control C that and go out to Primo, which I'll talk about here shortly. Oh, and all you need to go to Primo is just lib.colostate.edu. Primo pops up right here. All of you at Colorado State have access to Primo. Type in that article, hit search, and does it come up? And if it does, bingo, you've got a solution. There you go. Peer reviewed open access. Well, that's pretty easy. You'll be able to get that. I can get the full text. Click on the full text and find out what your options are. I'm not going to download it here, but it's likely there's already a PDF here. If not, you can order it through interlibrary loan, et cetera. So online access, and it shows it right down here a free e-journal, or I can get it through interlibrary loan. And in a lot of cases, you'll have the PDF right there. So that's the easiest thing in the world. You go out to Google Scholar, you find the article you want, you grab the title of the article, you plug it into lib.colostate.edu, and you have it on your device. Pretty cool. And again, different things that you can use, and it's probably self-evident. I can use the abstract. The authors provide keywords sometimes. So you got an article and they've got the first keyword. That's probably going to be a good one to go out and say, I should throw that keyword in to the browser or into Google Scholar and see if there's one that's a Lowry out there with 227,000 references that I probably don't want to miss. Right Now, hopefully you're in the field and you already know who the potentates are in that field, but this is a good way to go about it. And again, there's advanced search on Google Scholar. You can do a lot of customization. And you can do Google hacks and actually plug Google Scholar into a Python or other script if you so choose. I'm not gonna go through that today. So these are some other ones where we can go. And as I mentioned, Google Patents is a subset of Google Scholar. You just go out to patents.google.com and basically are getting a subset of what's out there on Google. So let's type in red herring on this one and see what we get. Are there patents about red herrings? Multiple key encryption with red herrings. Method and apparatus for providing a critical thinking exercise. That doesn't sound like it's going to hold up in court. The other one probably is this is obviously a security approach with red herring. So basically what a red herring would do in security is draw somebody into thinking a particular state of low entropy was a flaw in the system. It's probably to draw them into a honeypot or something of that nature. So it's a whole system process. But again, lots of, lots of things out there, even in this topic for something as innocuous or silly as red herrings. And of course, you can search for other patents on the European Patent Office. Justia combines a lot of those 
and USPTO.gov, which is US Patent and Trade Office. All right. <clears throat> As I mentioned, Primo, this almost anything, the Primo for articles, books, and more, right on lib.colostate.edu, incorporates all of these. But there's also these online. So you can go out to ResearchGate if you're not aware of that. A little bit scuffy because you're not actually supposed to post articles on there. So I don't use it as much. PubMed is used quite a bit. You might need licensing for that. Web of Science, Scopus, and then of course the ACM IEEE libraries are all incorporated into Primo and DBLP can give you, you can go there and look for an author and see what they have in a more computer science area, if that's your flavor. So these are other ones to use in addition to Google Scholar. I usually start off with Google Scholar and then move from there. But of course, um, a lot of my articles will come from these two digital libraries, which are incorporated into the lib.colostate.edu site. And the other thing is, is if you just go out to an IEEE or ACM article, it will allow you to log in from your institution, which is Colorado State, and it'll be tied to the same account you logged into Colorado State with. So you have lots of options out there, no excuse not to be grabbing those articles. All right, and so again, as I mentioned before, this is a way to use Primo. You perform your searches wherever you're gonna go. If it's out on Google Scholar or Google Patent, that's great. If it's not, go wherever it is, else it is. Select the articles that are not, that are the most salient. So I give an, a definition of saliency here. This is a good kind of rule of thumb, rule of thumb one that we've got, citations over the years since publication. So if something has only been out a couple of years and it already has a thousand citations, that's probably a very salient article, right? Because it's already picked up. A lot of articles will take five, sometimes 10 years to really pick up all of their citations. So for example, if you've got an article that was published in 2017, it's been cited 57 times already, that's a saliency of 11.4, it's just 57 divided by five. Whereas one published in 2012 with 68 citations, you might go, oh, that has more citations, but 68 divided by 10 is 6.8. This one is more salient and the odds are almost 100% certain. This one will end up with more citations in its lifetime than this one. So it gives you a good example. Nothing wrong with 68 citations, that's a lot for an article, but 57 in five years is a lot more in terms of just the number per year and the fact that it probably hasn't hit its peak yet. And articles do kind of go viral. I mean, that's how they work. You know, you'll find some person out there who's got an H index of one with, you know, 10,000 citations. And it's because they were on some huge government standard that came out with a whole bunch of, I think there was a guy I knew in, uh, when I worked in bone science, who was involved in the original paper by P-A-R-F-I-T-T, -T, Parfit. I should probably look that up, see how many references there are for that. And he was, he was basically on that article that had thousands of citations because it was the entire standard for what was called quantitative, still is called quantitative histomorphometry, which is how you measure things off of bones. So you could go look at that AM Parfit 1987. If one of you in the audience wants to go do that while I'm talking, you could type in the chat how many times that's been referenced and see if you can find the person on there who has the lowest H index, but has the huge citation for that. So it's kind of cool. All right. So you select from your reference list, those that are the most salient, possibly using this, or you can cut and paste the titles into Primo directly, or Primo will return a PDF, a book, or an interlibrary loan suggestion for almost any article, which we already saw. So we already saw this. I think I use red herring instead of pickled herring, but you'll find things like that as well. I mean, pretty much any topic will give you something salient. Be careful with those terms that also have an internet meaning because you might not get the references you want, I'm just saying. So the point is, is if you go out to Google Scholar, you're generally going to get serious articles first. Don't just go out to a general search engine or you may actually have to, you may never get your browser clean again with some of these topics is all I'm gonna say. All right, so that gives you a good place to start. How do I preserve my references? And this is usually where people start on this. I've had some of my PhD students start at this phase and they've never thought about anything before this. I'm like, you're, it's, I don't care if you're using Mendeley, it's nice you are, but you've got to actually have a process by which you're getting these references. <clears throat> so this is what I do. I save my searches and I rerun them each time I create my bibliography. It's a three column spreadsheet. There's not much to it. There's what my search actually is. There's the notes on the search. And then there's the authors. And the notes could be blank. I might not have anything there, but if I did this one, so this is the red herrings one. Let's see if that'll pull up. Yeah, oh, this is just working marvelously, I'll say. All right, so there we go. Red shifts and red herrings in geographical ecology. 
well, I've got other notes on this. So I move this over. It says resource curse is a term I need to be sure to include in my discussion. And the author that's associated with that is Brunschweiler, which is a cool name because it has, if you'll note, six consonants in a row in the middle. That beats me with my three. I kind of feel kind of feel emasculated. Anyway, moving on. We've got the red shifts in here. And I go, oh, yeah, there's Brunschweiler right there. That search led me to him or her. There you go, Krista Brunschweiler, School of Economics, University of East Anglia, UK. And I've got all of these here. And there you go. Resource curse revisited. That was cited 1,275 times. So that is a very influential article that I had better come to grips with in that field of red herrings. Kind of cool. So my notes get me to that. But it doesn't prevent me, again, if I go out there, it doesn't prevent me from getting all the new ones. So suppose I have not refreshed this since 2021. These are going to be all new ones that I haven't had a chance to look at. And their saliency is going to be low. They're not going to show up well on the previous one. So another thing you can do in the notes here is put down when you actually last searched. And again, very straightforward. My search that I share, um, here's one that says, okay, this one was argumentation and distraction. So another way of basically distracting people is a red herring. This came out of my previous search, search suggested by synonym for red herring. So I did a synonymic search off of this and I've got argumentation theory, a very short introduction. I'd like to have an argument, please. And there we go, Cite cited by 160, right? And so what do I have in here for my notes? Walton, that exact one there, which I also have a direct link to here because I can get to that directly through this link. Argumentation theory, a very short introduction. And I would argue you need a longer introduction than that. But again, that's the point of the paper. All right, so with that in mind, that's a really easy way to keep track of it. And you just have that one spreadsheet that you store wherever you're going to, you know, most be easily access. For me, I don't use Excel enough times. It'll usually be in the list of the last 20. And I go in there and go, yeah, I need to grab this, right? Because this keeps you from an important thing about science. Don't be complacent. I mean, we shouldn't be complacent in society, right? Russia got complacent. They've got a dictator in place, right? You can't be complacent about who your leaders are. You can't be complacent about what your set of references are. So do some work each time. It's not that much work if you save the search and then you just do a quick check over the year or two that you last did this to make sure you're up to date on new things, especially by key authors that you've used out here, right? So again, from a red herring, it led me to argumentation and distraction and led me down to logical fallacies. I've got a lot of other things in here that are giving me what I need to basically look at sketchy publications. That was intentional. So again, look at the Bodhisattva here and she says, my mantra is every hour spent on the references saves two hours spent on rewriting. Anybody not believe that? I can just tell you that. I spend, I, I, I and I'm like everyone else, I'm not looking forward to going through the references, right? I mean, this is a talk that could literally kill you. There may be some, somebody could die. It could be somebody who dialed 911 online already. I get that. The point is, is you want to make the references exciting. You want to make them be something that gets you engaged with your work. And if you do a good job with those, I guarantee you read through just three or four new articles that you haven't looked at last time. You're going to get two or three key insights that make your paper better. And it's going to protect you from rewriting. And moreover, it's going to give you a you know, declined, but encouraged to resubmit versus just a declined when you get to the actual references. All right, I probably spent enough time on it. Let's get into reference managers. So these are the ones that are actually supported out there on uh, Primo or lib.colodestate.edu, EndNote, Zotero, and Mendeley. I haven't used Zotero or Zotero. I know what a Totoro is. Those are kind of those little cute Japanese soot sprites. I'm good with that. Mendeley is the one that I've used, and I'll just give you a quick overview with a few slides on it. But the reasons you use a reference manager, ease of formatting, ease of reformatting, many are free and many are available through institutions. So two that are free are Mendeley and Zotero. You can get a paid version of Mendeley. And then EndNote is, is available through institutions. Those are the three that are in bold here because you can get those through Colorado State's library site. So I would encourage that if you use a reference manager for whatever reason, use one of those three because they're supported here. Reasons not to use reference managers or to qualify how often you use them. They are a gateway to complacency. And, com and if you get complacent about your references, you're gonna get complacent about every other aspect of your publication. Intransigence, people go, well, yeah, I'm just gonna do this and I'm only gonna use this one, et cetera. Um, idiosyncrasies, updates, incompatibilities, or suppose your list of references, creating your list of references is supposed to take time. 
So you're basically streamlining something that really isn't meant to be streamlined. And again, if you spend sufficient time on your references, you're going to have a better paper. And Vince Sill says, MS Word Reference Manager, you could use that if you choose. It's all up to the person. I'm not making a recommendation on these. I'm telling you which three are available for, C for CSU. Let's take a look now at the actual aspects of this. So Mendeley is fairly common. It's probably the most ubiquitous, most used, probably more than EndNote. These are the key aspects of it. I've got these handily over here for you. These are also available in some way, shape or form out on any Mendeley description site. So there is an add files menu that adds new entries to your library. There's a folders menu right over here, it's kind of tiny in this text here, but these are important. And that creates a new folder to organize your library. So it creates a folder with whatever you're currently viewing. And if you click this on all documents, it'll create a new top level folder. Okay, so very similar to a lot of organizational tools for that. Number three is sync right here, as you can see, and that pushes your changes to the cloud. And that makes them available for you on other devices or computers that you have Mendeley access on. And then search is important. And you know, right over here, we kind of know what search is. You use this to search your library and Mendeley desktop search function is context specific. So it'll perform a search within whatever folder you're in over here. Right, and you have to make sure all documents is selected if you want to search your entire library. And I find this very handy because then if you actually structure this so that you've got different folders for different areas that you work in, if you're somebody like me who's, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, you'll have a lot of different things that you want to move into. And you're like, I really don't want to be pulling stuff from, you know, orthopedics over into my paper on what maybe with Vinsel, who just had the question on computer science related tasks or AI related tasks. All right, so those are a couple of them. Discovery, number five, which is right over here. You can see Mendeley is up on top of there. There's literature search in Mendeley Suggest. That allows you to discover new references in a number of different ways. And again, I usually use Google Scholar for that, but you're welcome to use the Mendeley one. And then my library over here gives you your entire set of folders. That's your personal library. Number seven, of course, are groups down here, and that will be any groups you join or create. And then there's a main panel right up here which when in browsing mode, this will display the contents of the currently selected view. So if you've got just one of these, um, you know, this says all documents for this person and they've got every single document showing now, but if they'd selected a subset of the folders, some of these would drop out, okay? So that's your main panel. And again, kind of like email, you can look at authors, titles, year published in it and add it. It's almost like you're getting documents there at the same way you would be interfacing with a normal email browser. All right, the last couple of them here, over here is a details panel, which you know gives you details of whichever current one you're selecting. This one is by Aiden Amir, I believe, and it shows up over here. Yeah, E. Amir, Friedman, Saruga, et cetera, and it gives you all of the information about that. And then there's a filter panel here, which gives you different options to filter the current view. And then you can snap these to whichever format, whether it's Chicago or MLA or whatever other style you have to use. So that's a very good example. I think Mendeley is kind of lean and mean, gives you a good idea. Most of the reference managers that you would look at are going to have roughly these 10 features. So they're pretty, they're pretty handy, but again, they're not a substitution for what we've talked about before. All right, let's get into a couple of other items that are often important. What about confidential and or proprietary documents? Okay, so one city you are not allowed to visit as a research author is Mendacity. You should not be dishonest. If you wish to publish, but there are confidentiality or proprietary concerns, you still have to provide public references to the general area. So if you've got something that's a trade secret, but you're publishing a paper on it that's related to the trade secret, you need to take the topics from those private documents and look on Google Scholar. And again, you can do a form of de-identification or anonymization. If you've got a trade secret that has something very specific to your company, percolate it up one level and take that topical discussion. So if you have a particular part that's allowing you to do you know, um, reverse thrust as a plane is landing or something like that, and it actually has the part number in that, drop all of that and just say reverse thrust parts plop that into Google Scholar and see what you get. And you go, oh, that's what's publicly available. I should be aware of that, right? I didn't invent this. Wow, there's other people making these, who knew, right? And otherwise, if they are really private, you can't cite them without breach of disclosure, so you can't publish yet, okay? So if you can't do this search up here, don't publish it, right? So it's kind of a self-fulfilling 
type of situation here. And if you can find software, processes, diagrams, et cetera, that are similar to your work on GitHub or any other search, you can include that as a reference. So GitHub is, you're capable of putting that in as a reference, just like with web pages. You just need to cite the day you accessed it, right? So you can use Brewster Kalos, you know, um, way back machine or whatever to go back and get that. All right, that's pretty simple. What about IP? What is IP? Intellectual property, I can't tell you, it's a trade secret. No, IP means intellectual property. All right, so if you have not filed a provisional patent yet, don't publish. And can you cite a provisional US patent? Absolutely. This is one here in Chicago style. So this is myself and one of my students, variable distance sensor security devices and systems. It's a way of using metallic 3D printing to prevent a sensor from being readable, except in the direction you want it readable from. This was filed August 12, 12 2021. So we don't have any of the details in here because the final patent has to be filed before that. Well, now it's been done, so it's no big deal. Can you cite a trade secret? Yeah, well, that's an oxymoron. Once published, it's a trade practice, not secret. So there's no such thing as citing a trade secret because then it's not a trade secret. Okay, so that one, if that blows your mind, that's all right. Somebody's gonna steal your ideas, we're good. Can you cite a patent, copyright or trademark? Absolutely. And they should be distinguished from the surrounding text with like italics or capital letters. As you know, a trademark can be TM. And all you have to do is put TM out there. You don't have to have anything. You just say TM, I'm establishing that as a trademark. If it's in a jurisdiction and you're offering that for sale or somebody can access that, you have a trademark. The C is where you actually have it as a copyright and R is a registered copyright. So these go through the US PTO, the US Patent and Trade Office or the US Copyright Office. And preferably the initial time the trademark appears, you have to inform the public that the symbol word device or image you're utilizing is yours and displaying the trademark symbol more than once may be distracting, just do it once, okay? I mean, you may be really proud of your trademark. That's all good. All right, so those are pretty straightforward. We get to the culmination, which is perspective. And we have to have some perspective on this because otherwise you're like, wow, I just that's a half hour of my life I'm never gonna get back. You know, those of us in the room, we had lunch, so we're good. But those of you online, you're like, that's it. Well, maybe you're having lunch right now. In fact, I know you are. Then so, come on, man, napkin. All right, so these are what we're looking at from the perspective of reviewing. So reviewers are gonna check for those most highly regarded references. And usually that is somehow associated with citations, but not always. There could be things that are very highly regarded and you're in an area that's kind of niche, may not be cited a lot, but everyone's aware of it. So if the number of citations is high, like more than 50 or a salient score of more than 10, and again, this will depend on how, obviously if it's like determining protein concentrations in solutes, 220, 6,000 is kind of the benchmark there, but that's ridiculous, right? For most places, if you've got, if it's been cited 50 times or has a saliency score of more than 10, that's a possibly influential article. So you might want to consider at least reading it to see if it matters. And again, to read an article, read the abstract first, go read the conclusions and then decide if you should read the rest of it. That generally, I usually read articles, abstract conclusions, introduction. And then if I'm like, wow, this is still important, I'll go through the materials and the results if I think I'm gonna cite it. So you do wanna read the whole article if you're gonna cite it, but you can triage these pretty quickly with the abstract and the conclusions. Reviewers are also gonna look for the most pertinent references. So make sure you do a Google Scholar search on the title and your set of keywords, just to see what's out there. And the reviewers are gonna look for your their own references. So we gotta come back to the, this doesn't have to be a sociopath, but we come back to narcissism. So it makes sense to see See who reviews similar materials to your own for the journal or conference you send your article to, especially if it's a highly competitive one. So if you're trying to send something to IEEE CVPR, right? Um, computer vision and pattern recognition, about 3% of the articles get in. 99% of those 3% are from people who are already on the program committee for the conference. So you know they're gonna be the ones who are reviewing this. So make sure you try to make it match for them. Um, reviewers are looking for alternative approaches not covered. So if you did a whole bunch of things, but you didn't do, so suppose, heaven forfend, you're doing image recognition and you didn't use a convolutional neural network. You're gonna be in trouble nowadays, but you better at least reference them and discuss them because they are the de rigueur for that area. Reviewers wanna see public data sets used, reference them. So there's a clever way around this. And I see this increasingly in the reviews that I do. A author will say in there, this data will be released to the public upon publication. So they're like, I'm not giving you it right now because you're reviewing the article, but if it's accepted, they're gonna put it out there. So at least say that in your article and you should be ready to give out your data because transparency is an important way in which somebody can replicate your experiment. 
and your research. And keep in mind, the pharmaceutical industry, and I don't know who's on there, a couple of my students work in the pharmaceutical industry, two thirds of all of the pharmaceutical publications that are out there are not repeatable. They either don't have enough in the materials at methods and materials for you to actually replicate what they did, or the results are so sketchy that they can't get them again. Don't be one of those people. Be one of the one third who actually put something out there that somebody can validate. That's how science advances. So they wanna see public data sets. That's part of that process. That is, as I say in my intellectual property class, part of the social contract on which this country is founded. In regard, in, in us, for us to get certain rights, we also have to provide certain types of things as well. We have to vote so that the people who we vote for represent our needs. We have to provide the proper way, the what is called the preferred embodiment, so that we can keep other people from building that patent for 20 years. And you have to provide the way for somebody to replicate your experiment so that your paper can be influential. And then Sil said, I have a dev project right now that has to do with FDA drug approval docs, if anybody wants to connect. There you go, vincil.bishop at colostate.edu. Thanks, Vincil. All right, let's take the perspective of impact, right? So if you have a survey or review article, and we should all do you know, more than one of those in our career, right? They're not fun to do, but they're really good for helping people to see what the state of the art is, where things are going. I've worked with a couple of people in the last year on a couple of bibliometric reviews of fields. They're again, not fun to do. It's a heck of a lot of an analytics, but in the end, you're giving people an idea of where the state of the art is and they can come back to your article to see where the real references are. So you might also have a review or survey article that doesn't get referenced a lot, but you're providing a service to others. So the good thing about that is when, you've, when you write a survey or review article, guess who's the most up-to-date in that field out of pretty much anyone, it's gonna be you. So perform and incorporate multiple searches. Don't just do a review on one thing and say you're done. Also, if you're undecided about a reference, reread it and plan to incorporate it. Connect all in the, connecting to all relevant articles is not a choice, it's a primary responsibility. If you are not providing relevant articles, what's the point? Most of the time, references are just something tacked on the end. They're not usually space limited. And the more you contextualize the references that you include, the more likely your reader will look to your article as a fundamental article in the field. So don't just cite them. Say why it's important. Say how it's important in context of the other ones you've read and how you're going to bank on it to differentiate in your own article. All right, so remember, contextualization, putting this contextualization around it also makes you look competent. It's understanding. It shows you have the ability to see how your work impacts the rest of the field, like this meteor did in Winslow, Arizona. All right, the last one, the perspective of perspective. So I think you can figure out what RTFA is because we probably know what RTFM is, right? So just read the effing article. Don't even think about putting a reference in your article without rereading it. That's one of the main problems with using a reference manager. And that's why I say you don't have to do that. You can do the little spreadsheet thing that I showed you. Complacency is complicity and your writing will definitely suffer. And if you are complacent about your references and just are trying to get them out of the way, it's gonna show in your writing. And people will know that. They'll be like, what? And we do that all the time, right? I mean, if you've um, ever read Stephen Jay Gould's Mismeasure of Man, Classic example, right? Spearman, who is a racist, used a whole bunch of sus data to try to show differences in races for intelligence inferred from brain cavity size, et cetera, et cetera, un unbelievable stuff. And all Stephen Jay Gould was, said, I should go get the original data. So he had to go through one paper to another paper to another paper, traced it back and found out the data was absolute BS. There was no relevance to it at all. So don't let that happen to you. If you cite some article that's highly cited and you haven't seen what it's citing or where it got its in information from, you could be guilty of promulgating a lie. All right, number two, context is everything. So a sentence taken out of context can lead to the perspective of your article being rejected or ignored, even if accepted for publication. Don't just cite something because there was one sentence in there that said that. They might have been hypothesizing, especially if you're in the social sciences. It might have been a completely different thing. And then remember, attitude is everything. Don't have this attitude that it's a drudge to go through references. Make it the centerpiece of your writing. You know, celebrate the talents and accomplishments of your peers. I hate to tell you this, but you're all smart, but there's a lot of other smart people too. Why don't you celebrate what they're doing, right? A rising tide lifts all the boats. We work together in science, not against each other. All right, and again, learning is not something you do, it's what you are when you think about it. I mean, we think of ourselves as our brain. Your brain is basically a library of everything you've done and everything you've learned. 
So if you stop, your brain will rot. Don't do that. So this is one way to do it is by not doing RTFA. Don't just be, don't be that person. Go ahead and read it. All right, thank you. Time for questions. We are good. I thought I had left no time. So if there are questions you want to ask through chat or through voice, feel free. I'll leave my slides on, but I will no longer full screen them. All right, looks like just comments so far. Thank you, doll. Thank you, Vince. So, and anybody else got a question? Anything you want me to go into more depth on? Thanks, Jose. Hey, Sacha. I guess I'll be seeing you in about half an hour. <laughs> Good to see you here, Sacha. I didn't know you're going to be here. <laughs> All right, any questions from the audience? Oh, thanks, Dean. Thanks, Ricky. I appreciate it. All right. Looks like a lot of people owe me money. Not, yeah, yeah. Not, not a lot of questions, but a lot of a lot of people owe my owe me money. So all right. So these slides are definitely available if um, you've posted them up where people can get them. They will be posted. Okay, Catherine will post this with the recording of the talk. And as always, if you want to come back to me on any questions you can. Oh, I see, um, Peter, quick question. Has anyone ever cited CFR in Zotero? Um, probably. I, I don't see why they wouldn't have, right? So do you want to, do you want to, oh, you're on mute. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, you can put, I mean, you can put websites in there. You can put um, GitHub things, et cetera. Yeah, sorry, Peter. I, I know your question's probably a little more contextualized, but. I think I've answered that. And I mean, again, what you put in, I think um, Zotero and, um, and probably, it's probably Zotero, I've just got Totoro on my mind, uh, but certainly Mendeley and all those are incorporate everything that you put into it. So there's no real rules for that. Um, sometimes it'll struggle. Like if you put in something that's a little bit off and you go, okay, I want this going to MLA or Chicago format and it goes, well, and just gives you a bunch of white space that does happen. So it's all good. All right, um, you've unmuted for people. They can ask. Well, I, I was going to try to break the ice, but I, oh. why don't you ask the questions from the okay. audience? Okay. Yeah. So Jose says, can you link both your Excel spreadsheet with EndNote or the others? Yeah, I do believe you can ingest your Excel spreadsheet in from them. I mean, how the formatting is going to come out of that, Jose, is going to be, you know, dependent on what the format you use for the Excel spreadsheet is and which version you have of those. But you can definitely ingest. Um, Excel data into that. Okay. Are there any other ones? Okay. And again, I, I would, I guess if, if you're not somebody who's going to live off of your reference manager, I would just probably use Mendeley because there is a free version. It scales up then. Most corporations where you're going to be involved in library science or something like that will use that. So it will scale over nicely. And generally it's well supported and you'll be able to find other people who know all the little, you know, nuances in it. So that would be my recommendation. But again, that's because it's one that I'm most familiar with. So, all right. Maybe I'll ask another question. Sure, Tom. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think is uh, happening more often is that there's sort of, uh, you know, if you are searching for literature, there's sort of very recent literature that is, is not really peer reviewed, but is in um, you know archive formats and things like that. So maybe just share what you think about those kind of uh, references or referencing those kind of things. Um, you could probably run across that more in your AI. Oh yeah. That I do in my you know yeah. this square uh, environmental assessment work or something. Like I'm that. not sure about that. And that. Your work's pretty fun. Um, so for those of you who can't hear, I don't know if Tom yeah. is Tom's quite but it's an excellent set of questions. So if you're putting out something like on on archive, right? So the archive site and they'll it, a lot of those through again through not even as much the narcissism side of things, but the convenience side of things that I talked about for the internet, somebody types something into the general internet, not into Google Scholar, and they get archived, but they'll also get the archive site, which has an X in it, I forget what that is, ARXIV. You'll see a lot of citations for those, and that is originally stems out of laziness of just typing in something in the browser and then getting those back. They are not necessarily peer reviewed at all, 
And what I do, so Tom asked the question, how do you handle those? I grab the author and the title and look to see if there's actually something more relevant to that elsewhere. And a lot of times there isn't, and they have a lot of citations and you're tempted to just go, I'm gonna use that. But if I can't find something by the same authors out on Google Scholar or one of the major digital libraries that they should be in, like if it's something that clearly should have been in JAMA, let's say the Journal of the American Medical Association, which has an, an impact factor of like 45, and they don't have anything out in that area. It's like, wait, how is this legit? Is it just something that's gone viral, but it isn't peer reviewed? So I'm a little bit scared by it. So I do temper those, but it's a good way to find those. You go, oh, this author, let's see if they've done anything else in that field. And I'll go ahead and follow them up. It looks like Dahl is following up on that. What about government papers and reports that aren't peer reviewed or patents? Do we need to cite those? You definitely need to cite any government papers or reports if you're using those. For example, they lead off into standards or the, um, the, you know, the white papers around standards and patents, of course, should be cited because they are a, they are peer reviewed. So patents are absolutely peer reviewed because they have been peer reviewed by, usually by internal patent committee, and then it goes past the patent agents at the US Patent and Trade Office. So that is just like a thesis or a dissertation. On the surface, you go, well, that isn't really peer reviewed because it's going through, but it's like, wait, that's actually one of the most strongly peer reviewed documents ever. And Dahl, just saying, I know you got that dissertation coming up. That's You're going to have a whole bunch of peers reading through that. That's about as peer-reviewed as it gets. And the patents are the same way because, again, they have multiple stages at which office actions can occur. And you could have as many as two separate office actions that you have been able to successfully respond to when it gets published. So that definitely has to. And if it's a government paper or report and it's from a reputable agency like DOE or you know, DARPA or NSF or something, it's been peer reviewed. It's been peer reviewed internally, just like a thesis or dissertation, definitely need to cite it. Great question. That would be my answer to that. Any other ones? All right. Well, I guess we're I guess we're at the, at the end point then. If there's no further questions. Well, again, this was uh, my pleasure. I hope you all enjoyed this. Oh, Matt's got one more. Sorry. Should I refuse or reuse? Pardon me. Citations if I followed up research to my first article, which is approved for publication but won't be published for a year. Uh, yes, you just say that that is in in press or in process. So yes, you can actually have a citation that's in progress, and a lot of times what that'll do for you, Matt is in the interim, if that hasn't been fully cited or if it has an online presence, that can be something that is updated as, as it goes through. Because keep in mind, if you're citing something that isn't gonna appear yet, but is gonna appear later and you're going through a peer review process, I hate to say this, but I just went through an article that the first version of it came out last February and I just signed off for approval for that last week. That paper has been in review for over a year. So again, it's gonna depend on how long those go, but yes, absolutely. If you've got something that is approved for publication, you can put it in your citations. What you do is you do the normal citation and then where you get to the page numbers, which you don't have yet, you put comma in press and you're good. And that'll work. Great question, Matt, thanks. We're doing game show vibe. All right, with that, I will again thank you. I hope you enjoyed this technical session on finding and organizing references as part of the systems engineering department here at Colorado State University. Again, March 4th and do better with your references. Good to have you here today. Have a good one. Thanks.